DW Inside Europe Hello and welcome. I'm Kate Laycock in Germany. On today's program, migration. Chancellor Olaf Scholz holds a summit in Berlin. And what became clear now in this particular summit is the fact that not even among the 16 regions, let alone between the regions and the federal government, there seems to be consensus as to what the approach should be. And Italy announces a new refugee processing pact with Albania. Those stories plus NFL in Germany. The Kansas City Chiefs play the Miami Dolphins. That's all here on Inside Europe. Der Übergang zu einem atmenden System mit den 7500 als Pauschale pro Kopf. That's the sound of a bleary-eyed German chancellor announcing what he termed a historic moment for the country after a marathon session of talks which went on into the small hours of Tuesday morning. Diskussion, wo Fragen der Finanzen eine Rolle spielen in der the topic was migration, and the deal which Olaf Scholz was so keen to present involves a tightening of the benefit system and measures designed to make deportations easier. DW's political correspondent Thomas Sparrow was following the story for us in Berlin right up until the 2 a.m. press conference. That's correct. They took a very long time. In fact, it is not very usual to have a press conference in the Chancellery in Berlin at three in the morning. But this is precisely what happened after many hours in which German Chancellor Scholz and the leaders of Germany's 16 regions met to discuss what has undoubtedly become a very controversial issue, migration. It is, It has been controversial for a long time already, but it becomes particularly difficult to tackle. It becomes particularly controversial at times when Germany is receiving more and more migrants, especially those that are described as irregular migrants. Uh, the government said that between January and September, around 230,000 people presented asylum applications coming from so-called third countries, a number which is much higher than in 2022. And in fact, authorities are expecting that number to rise even above 300,000 for this yeah, so it's a high number because, among other things, it does not include the arrival of people from Ukraine in recent years. That is a different category here in Germany. So you have, on the one hand, this 230,000 asylum applications, and on the other hand, those who arrived from Ukraine. And both groups are actually a big challenge for German authorities to try, obviously, and um, provide for them initially to also integrate into German society and so on. So there was a lot of momentum uh, behind the desire for a consensus. Why then did it take so long to reach an agreement, Thomas? What were the sticking points? I've covered several of these migration summits in the past, also during the so-called refugee crisis in 2015 and 2016, by the way, another period which was marked by long negotiations into the night. And what became clear now in this particular summit is the fact that not even among the 16 regions, let alone between the regions and the federal government, there seems to be consensus as to what the approach should be. And that's why they had many hours in which they negotiated everything from the amount of money that regions should receive from the federal government to deal with the arrivals of refugees, the amount that refugees themselves or asylum seekers themselves should receive as benefits, whether those benefits should be shortened, cut or changed in any way, and also what should happen with those who have already arrived in Germany, but who are not entitled to stay and therefore should be deported. In the end, what happened after many hours of discussion was during that uh, press conference, they presented a, a document with some initial agreement. However, what's important to stress from this initial agreement is that this is just the initial document. Now, this has to be actually put into practice, and that is a different matter altogether. 
It was interesting that you mentioned their reporting during the 2014-2015 migrant crisis. I mean, famously at the height of that, Angela Merkel, then the Chancellor, said, we can do it. And it seems that there is a, a big gulf between that kind of rhetoric and uh, Olaf Scholz's current approach. What can you tell me about the political shifts that have been taking place in Germany since the Merkel era? You're correct when you point out that sentence which has become one of Angela Merkel's most recognisable slogans, but it's also important to stress that in her later years, Angela Merkel's government also shifted towards what has been described as a more restrictive policy in terms of migration, asylum and refugees. So it was not only this open door policy as it's been described. Later on, Angela Merkel's government also shifted to something which I would describe as similar to what we're seeing now, a focus on how people should be deported if they need to be deported, how the numbers can be restricted and so on. Obviously, in every case, German officials have stressed that they will comply with international law, with international rules that require, obviously, each country to accept people who um, apply for asylum because they are persecuted, for example, on political or religious grounds. So they are going to continue doing that because that is something that is that is enshrined in international law. But at the same time, the focus is on what to do with those whose asylum applications are not successful and who need then to leave the country, those who arrive irregularly. And that's the focus also here with Olaf Scholz. He stressed in a uh, interview which was widely cited that it's time for Germany to begin deportations at a, at a large scale. It was cited nationally and internationally. There was a lot of controversy here in the country. And one of the big questions is how the country, how the government plans to achieve this. One element which was actually discussed during the summit was maybe by agreeing with some of the countries of origin, let's say signing agreements with them so that they then receive back the people who left in the first place by, for example, also presenting uh, other offers at the same time on the table. So not only telling them to get their people back, but also making sure that, for example, those who could leave legally could also come to Germany to fill some of the gaps in uh, that Germany has in terms of, of legal skilled migration. So that's one element there. I mean, another element is perhaps that, uh, you know, whereas Angela Merkel was um, a centre-right conservative politician, Olaf Scholz is the leader of a supposedly social democratic party. What can you tell me there about the significance of this hardline rhetoric coming now from the centre-left? I can imagine that many in the centre-left, even many in uh, Olaf Scholz's own party, are not particularly happy with the decisions that have been made and with that tone that the Chancellor himself said when he's talking about deportations at a large scale. But it's also important to remember that Olaf Scholz was a part of Angela Merkel's previous government. He was the vice-chancellor. So in a way, uh, there's a somewhat a continuity here. Yes, it is clear that Angela Merkel comes from a more conservative approach, where there's, so, where there's Olaf Scholz comes from a social democratic approach. Nevertheless, as part of a government coalition and at a time when migration is a significant challenge, the government here in Germany, the current government, has moved towards this more restrictive approach. By the way, an approach that has been criticised by human rights organisations, by migrant organisations. Um, one of them, Pro Azul, even saying that the later it got during the summit, the worse the decisions were in the end, because in Pro Azul's opinion, they were strengthening a policy of exclusion, deportation and isolation. And basically that meant that the government was joining what they described as the right-wing hardliners in the European Union. So you can clearly see that these agreements, whereas the government might present them in a positive light, saying that it's the right way forward, organisations, human rights organisations in particular, are not very happy with that approach indeed. DW's political correspondent Thomas Sparrow there. Now, just hours before Chancellor Schultz was finally able to present his new migration regime, Italy's Prime Minister Giorgia Meloni unveiled her own plan, announcing that Italy is to build two migrant centres in nearby Albania to bring down the numbers of people arriving to Italy by sea. As Megan Williams reports from Rome, it's a move that human rights groups are calling repressive. Libyan 
More than 145,000 desperate people have made it to the shores of Italy this year, almost double the arrivals of last year. And that's a political problem for far-right Prime Minister Giorgia Maloney, elected last year on a platform to stop the arrivals. Promising a naval blockade if necessary. That's not happening. So to try to bring the numbers of migrants down, Maloney has turned to deals with neighboring countries. This summer, she spearheaded a UN accord with Tunisia to block boatloads of people from leaving in exchange for hundreds of millions in funding. Though the EU money hasn't yet made it to Tunisia and the boats are still leaving. This week, she announced another deal, this one between Italy and Albania where Italy will build migrant detention centers in the small former communist country across the Adriatic Sea. She calls it a beautiful form of cooperation. Starting next spring, the centers will hold some 3,000 migrants, gearing up to 36,000 a year. Italian authorities will process the migrants' asylum claims and try to send those who fail to qualify back home. If that doesn't work, after 18 months in detention, people will be sent here to Italy. Per trovare rifugio, per scappare dall'inferno, Albanian Prime Minister Edi Rama described the deal as part of his country's history of helping persecuted people, Italians, Jews, and others. He said Albania is a loyal friend to Italy and is part of Europe, though still missing the U for European Union. Albania was granted European Union candidate status nearly a decade ago but hasn't yet joined the bloc. The deal with Italy marks the first time an EU country has outsourced its asylum procedures to a country attempting to join its ranks. No, sicuramente si vuole avere un rapporto più favorevole con con il governo italiano. This is about Albania wanting a more favorable relationship with Italy as a way to facilitate membership to what remains of the European Union, says the head of Italian Coalition for Freedom and Civil Rights, Arturo Salerni. Un ulteriore tentativo di esternalizzare. Salerni says for Italy, the deal is an attempt to offload the migrant issue and shirk its obligation to provide refuge. Salerni and others say isolating migrants in what are essentially detention centers in another country breaks national and EU law. And he says it poses a huge obstacle for those held inside the centers to get access to legal help with Italian lawyers representing them in a country away. Italy's center-left opposition say the new centers would be akin to Guantanamo Bay prison. The European Commission says it has yet to see the agreement, but that it must comply with European law. Megan Williams, DW, Rome. DW is part of InfoMigrants, a multilingual platform providing migrants to Europe with information at every step of their journey. Find out more at infomigrants.net. I'm Kate Laycock in Germany. You're listening to Inside Europe. Now, Germany may be basketball world champions. Yeah, we still can't believe that one either. But the home of American football is still very much in the US. That being said, the NFL's very much attuned to the commercial possibilities presented by its not insignificant German fan base, which is why last Sunday's much anticipated game between the reigning Super Bowl champions Kansas City Chiefs and the Miami Dolphins took place in Frankfurt. 
The match came one year after the NFL celebrated its German premiere in Munich when 70,000 fans witnessed the Tampa Bay Buccaneers beat the Seattle Seahawks in what was hailed as the NFL's most successful international game in terms of viewership and merchandise sales. Our reporter Ben Batka went swimming with the Dolphins. Well, almost. Let's go, Dolphins! Let's go! Let's go, Dolphins! Let's go! Let's go, Dolphins! When Denny Johnson left Germany in 2003, he had long been a die-hard Miami Dolphins fan but had never attended a game. Fast forward to the present, Johnson is not only a season ticket holder, he's also become a linchpin of the Dolphins' global fan community, which gathered in Frankfurt to support their team in the NFL's second-ever regular season game on German soil and first in Frankfurt. Although it had been 12 years since he last visited his second home, being around like-minded Dolphins fans felt like an instant family vacation, Johnson says. When you see someone and you see the colors, it's family, and, and both people smile at one another, and, and I don't know if everyone has that. I've been around the whole league. I've got friends from all other fans. I live in Tennessee Titans, Atlanta Falcons territory, and it's just not the same. I just think that's part of uh, what makes the Dolphins fan base so special. One of the many fan clubs Johnson reunited with are the Miami Dolphins Germany. Since it was founded in 2020, membership of the registered fan club has steadily grown, now having around 400 members. Over the weekend, the club held several events, including at Louisiana, the official bar for Dolphins in Frankfurt. Let's go, Dolphins! On the eve of Sunday's game against the Kansas City Chiefs, the line to get inside was spread out several meters as fans from near and far drank beer, munched on chicken wings and broke out into the team's fight song throughout the night. Germany's appetite for American football is large and growing. 3.6 million Germans say they are avid NFL fans. That's 25% more than in Britain, which has hosted regular season games since 2007. Johnson, born four years before the Dolphins' very first season in 1969, launched a Dolphins fan club and charity, The Positive Purpose, after attending the International Fan Club Weekend in Miami in 2019, a yearly reunion of Dolphins from all over the world. At last year's edition, Denny welcomed more than 300 Dolphins from more than 10 countries. One of them was Bianca Guschke from Germany. We also learned to love the Dolphins after last year's experience in Miami. We met Danny and he showed us something of the area and we did a huge barbecue and grilled some lobsters there. So friendly to us. They didn't know us before but yeah. they talked to us like we are members since years. Uh, this year we met him again at the Louisiana Spa and then became a member of the German Miami Dolphins fan club. Guschke said she and her friends mingled with Dolphins from the UK, from France, the Netherlands, Ireland, Canada, Portugal and other countries in Frankfurt, a testament to the geographically diverse turnout. Johnson, who himself played three seasons for a German amateur team in the 1980s, thinks satellite fans are more enthusiastic than domestic fans. Things come to domestic fans too easy. We've had it for so long, sometimes, ah, oh, will, will I go to the game, will I not? They wouldn't think twice here. When the opportunity's there, it's gold debt, as a German would say. It's, it's gold. All 32 teams were represented here this weekend. And it's just special. The Frankfurt game was not only a homecoming for Danny Johnson, but also for American football itself. In 1977, the Frankfurter Löwen became Germany's first American football club. The first regular competition followed two years later. In 1990, the NFL played the first of five preseason games in Berlin's Olympiastadion and even kick-started a global league a year later, rebranding it to NFL Europe in 1995 with six European teams. The five teams in Germany helped popularize the sport, partly because they stuck around longer and were more successful than the four non-German teams. Today, there are 500 registered, mostly amateur teams, with more than 70,000 members in Germany, according to the German Olympic Sports Confederation. The annual championship game, the German Bowl, attracted a high of more than 20,000 fans in 2019 and took place several times in, you guessed it, Frankfurt.
crowd of 50,000 NFL fans turned Deutsche Bank Park, Germany's seventh largest soccer stadium, into a football temple that rivals famous NFL arenas like the ones of the Seattle Seahawks, the Pittsburgh Steelers or the Green Bay Packers. German Dolph fan Michael Hartwig says what's special about being a Dolphins fan is that they stick together no matter how their team performs. We have nearly 20 years without success, but we are strong, stay together for the Dolphins every time. We discuss it, but we don't blame it. One hour later, we will celebrate the Dolphins in the Louisiana pub again. Despite the 21-14 loss to the Kansas City Chiefs, the Frankfurt weekend was a rousing fan fest for Dolphins. After another game in Frankfurt this weekend, the NFL will return to Munich next year, where it had its premiere on German soil a year ago, before Frankfurt will be tapped once again in 2025. Go for the Erlebnis and nicht das Ergebnis, is what I always say. So, you know, go for the experience and not the final outcome. This is kind of our escape, just like going to a music concert, win or lose. We all go back to our lives afterwards. It seems that for many Dolphins fans who came to Frankfurt, being members of the global Dolphins community is just as important as their team's success on the football field. Ben Bradke, DW, Frankfurt. I think I'd better slip in the Spotify quiz segments here whilst we're still feeling pumped. Last week, we asked you to take a guess. Which country saw the most rule of law backsliding between 2017 and 2022? Now, most of you guessed Hungary, and I have to put my hands up here because that is exactly what I would have guessed too if I hadn't read Euronews' handy guide to the 2023 State of Democracy report. The actual answer is the UK, a fact so shocking that it is actually the subject of our next Q&A, which is coming up just after the break. This week, we're going to take a rain check on the quiz format entirely and try something a bit different instead. If you open up the Spotify app and go to this week's edition of Inside Europe, then you will find a poll where you can express your views on what we could be doing to make the show even more enjoyable for you. So more sports and culture, more longer form interviews, more panel discussions, whatever it is that you think you would like to hear us doing more of, then you get to vote for it. And all you have to do is head over to Spotify and take part in the poll. Other than Spotify, we are, of course, also on all the other usual podcast platforms as well. And as of last month, that also includes YouTube. To find us, look for the DW Podcast channel, where you'll find Inside Europe together with a whole host of other DW podcasts as well, including Living Planet, On the Green Fence and Don't Drink the Milk. Don't drink the milk. Don't drink the milk. Don't drink the milk. No, this isn't a podcast about milk. If you like historical intrigue, a bit of culture, and a sprinkling of controversy, this one's for you. I'm Rachel Stewart, and I'm traveling around Europe, following the hidden history of everyday things as they're exported through time and around the world, by force, by chance, or by choice. No need to pack your bags. Just subscribe to Don't Drink the Milk wherever you listen to podcasts. Just a quick reminder of our feedback address, insideeurope at dw.com. Drop us a line with your ideas or comments for the show. And when you're doing that, please do let us know where you're tuning in from. We're always interested to hear. This is Inside Europe, and I'm Kate Laycock in Germany.
This is Inside Europe and I'm Kate Laycock in Germany. Coming up in the next half hour, cause for alarm. We get a lawyer's perspective on democratic backsliding in the UK. I mean, the rule of law, it's a foundation of every democratic society. It's about lots of things. It's about laws being made in a transparent way. It's about everybody being equal before the law, including the government. It wasn't inevitable why 90% of Danish Jews survived the Holocaust. Border force, France cracks down on migrant crossings from Italy. And sporting chance, Spain creates Olympic ambassadors for refugees. Broadcasting from Germany, this is Inside Europe. Now, as you may remember, we used our quiz question last week to highlight the publishing of the Global State of Democracy report issued each year by the International Institute for Democracy and Electoral Assistance, International IDEA, an intergovernmental organisation headquartered in Stockholm. One finding in particular shocked us, and that is that, other than Belarus, no single European country saw a greater decline in the rule of law between 2017 and 2022 than the UK. And Britain also saw a significant decline in rights and representation during the same period. Now, it's important to emphasise here that we're talking about a decline in scoring and not the UK's overall placing on the democracy index. In those terms, there is still a world of difference between the UK and countries like Hungary and Poland, for example. However, the trajectory is alarming. So we took legal advice and spoke to Janine Walker, legal manager at the UK legal non-profit organisation, The Good Law Project. Could she, I asked, outline the key legislative changes that have caused this democratic backsliding? Yes, I mean, you're really right. It is quite shocking that we're seeing this decline in the rule of law. In recent years, we've had the Nationality and Borders Act in 2022, and then the Illegal Migration Act this year. They concern the rights of of migrants, mainly asylum seekers. They make it virtually impossible for anybody who arrives in the UK irregularly on a small boat crossing the channel to even claim asylum and they vastly expand the powers of the government to detain migrants and really limit the oversight of the judiciary um, in relation to their detention, their their liberty. We've seen also in recent years the Police Crime Sentencing and Courts Act 2022 and then the Public Order Act 2023, and these really give wide-ranging and draconian powers that curb the fundamental right to protest They introduce a range of new criminal offences, orders that could ban protests entirely. We've also seen the Strike Act this year, which limits the right to go on strike, requirements for voters to have ID before voting. So that's just a few examples of, of the really wide range of legislation that encapsulates really this quite alarming narrative of repression. Right. Okay. So, I mean, why are these changes happening? Because, you know, I'm thinking that in the context of Hungary and Poland, you know, we're used to talking very, very confidently about the systematic undermining of the rule of law. Is that a description which could now be applied to the UK as well? Yes, I absolutely think it can. I mean, the rule of law, it's a foundation of every democratic society. It's about lots of things. It's about laws being made in a transparent way. It's about everybody being equal before the law, including the government. It's about the law safeguarding the dignity and human rights of all human beings and the state not misusing its power. And, you know, what we're seeing, for example, in the UK at the moment is the government ignoring concerns about international law being being violated. That's what the UN said about the Illegal Migration Act. We're also seeing the government undermining and really putting pressure on the judiciary, which should be uh, completely independent. They've referred to judges as enemies of the people and sort of indicated that they wouldn't necessarily comply with judgments from the court. The government are also attacking lawyers who are just doing their jobs. 
undermining human rights and sort of threatening to leave the European Convention on Human Rights. We've also seen a lot of um, corruption, really. During the pandemic, the government were awarding contracts for things like um, protective equipment uh, to their donors and close associates of ministers. That's something that Good Law Project worked on to uncover. So I think it's absolutely right to say that we're seeing a systematic undermining of the rule of law um, at the moment. And the Conservative Party uh, has been in power now since 2019. They won a really large majority in that election. So that majority enables them to get laws through Parliament so their agenda can pass without enough opposition. And this government is really to the far right of the Conservative Party. It's a time of economic crisis and we're expecting a general election will happen next year. The Conservatives are actually behind in the polls. So we're really trying to appeal to voters and trying to make political capital out of really by attacking the rights of minorities, be that uh, whether that's migrants or, or other minorities. Do you see Brexit as having played a role perhaps as well? Yes, yes, I do think that Brexit has also played a role in this sort of decline of rights that we're seeing in the UK. I mean, the the campaign for Brexit, which was called the Leave campaign, had a slogan which was take back control. And that really embodies the sort of populist narrative and also quite racist narrative that was that, that was really legitimised by major political figures calling for the UK to leave the EU and sort of retake control of its borders or its sovereignty. Brexit has also played a role in the economic downturn in the UK, and it also possibly enables the UK to leave the European Convention of Human Rights, which is something that the government has been open about wanting to do. So that's a, that's a sort of a threat on the horizon. What, what about the situation right now? I'm thinking particularly about the right to protest, which has always been an issue, but now coming to a head around the issue of anti-war demonstrations and Palestinian solidarity marches. What's happening here that's new and what are your key concerns at the moment? Yes, I mean, this is something which is incredibly topical and, and the situation is really still developing. There's a big march planned for this Saturday, and the government for weeks now have been using really inflammatory language. I'm thinking particularly of the Home Secretary, Suella Braverman, who's described the Palestine Solidarity Marches as hate marches, when in fact everybody who attends them says that the vast majority of people who go, and it's, and it's um, thousands and thousands of people, are calling for peace. And this week, we've seen the government really put pressure on the police to potentially ban the march that's planned for Saturday. Saturday is Armistice Day, so a day of remembrance for for people who've died in wars. Um, And they say that that to have this march would, would desecrate or be disrespectful to Armistice Day when, in fact arguably quite the opposite is true. It's a, it's a march that's calling for a ceasefire and for, for peace. I was talking to Janine Walker, legal manager at the UK legal non-profit organisation The Good Law Project there. This week, Germany marks the anniversary of Kristallnacht, also called the Night of the Breaking Glass. The November 1938 pogrom was a watershed moment in the anti-Semitic terror which culminated in the Holocaust. Was this end inevitable, though? The stories of the Jews of Denmark, some 90% of whom were saved, suggests not. And it's for that reason that this is a story that should be told and told again and again and again. And this year, that is exactly what is happening in Denmark as the country commemorates the 80th anniversary of one of the most incredible rescue stories in European history. Adrian Murray reports from the harbour town of Gilalai on Denmark's eastern coast. In the autumn sunshine, Gilalai's harbour bustles with boats and visitors picnicking by the water, a moment far removed from the dramatic scenes here 80 years ago, as Danish Jews fled from the Nazis. At least 1,500 people were escaping through the Gilalai area. That's Lars Thompson, a retired journalist and local guide from North Zealand Museum. We are sitting on the end of a pier of the inner harbour 
At that time, back in the 43, there would have been around 20 uh, fisher boats, half the size of the present ones. Many in this close-knit fishing community helped to hide their fellow countrymen as they awaited the crossing to Sweden. They were moved from farmyard to farmyard, from house to house. Uh, they were staying in outer houses or in haylofts in the village. Within months of World War II breaking out, German armed forces had occupied Denmark. Initially, the government collaborated, but three years later, relations broke down. In uh, the spring and summer of 43, there were strikes, there were increased sabotage. The Danish government stepped down. In September, orders were sent from Berlin to round up Jews. Sweden was the only place you could go to from Denmark in that situation. However, a tip-off came from inside the German command. Danish politicians warned rabbis, and soon whispers spread through the community. Leaving from a string of harbours along Denmark's east coast, more than 7,000 Jews escaped. Standing on the shore, you can see the hilly skyline of Sweden, just 20 kilometres away. Night after night, week after week, this was a terrifying escape route for thousands of Danish Jews, making a desperate bid for safety. Six million Jews were murdered by Nazi Germany during the Holocaust. Denmark stands out as one of the few European countries where most of the Jewish population survived World War II. And over recent weeks, that's been commemorated at events across Denmark and through exhibitions in the United States. Not everyone got away. Around 480 Danish Jews were deported to camps, where 50 died. Here in Gilalai, 60 people were captured as they hid in the loft of this church. Local resident Tova Utschot was among 130 Jewish children who stayed behind, hidden from the Germans. When we had to flee from Copenhagen, I was three years old. Now 83, she's one of the few living survivors. Some fishermen met us on the station and uh, we came to a hayloft. There we had to wait. I talked and talked. It was dangerous. She was taken in by a local fisherman and his wife when her mother left for Sweden. I couldn't understand why his mother. Mm -hmm. And I ask and I cry. And that I can remember. However, the long separation took its toll. A lady came. I couldn't see it was my mother, but she was. We were never mother and, and daughter more. Right. We were his friend, but not mother and daughter. After the war, she stayed with her foster parents, who, like many Danes, had risked themselves assisting with shelter or transport. I think people have thought they are the same as us. We have to help. And they did it. Danish historian Bent Blutnikau has authored a book about his own father's dramatic escape. There were ten members in the boat, a little rowboat, and it was in the evening and it was dark and the boat took in water. They had to jump into the water and three people drowned. The survivors were brought ashore and hid in the hospital, but soon German soldiers came knocking. In the moment, the Nazi came in the front door. The freedom fighters got them out of the back door. So it was very dramatic. And later in the day, the seven people got over to Sweden with a fish boat. 1943 was a turning point in the war. We have to be very grateful that the freedom fighters and the spontaneous action in '43 and the fishermen's rescue rescued the Jews. That was very brave, and it's one of the very important happenings in Danish history. And it also brought us into the Allied camp, because it was a debate. Did Denmark belong to the Allied camp, or did they belong to the German camp? The timeline was that most people accepted the German dominance and occupation until the beginning of 43. More recently, it's been debated whether the Nazi commanders in action had allowed Danish Jews to get away, and why. 
the war was changing and everybody knew at that time that the Germans were going to be defeated. They were anti-Semites and they were only interested in rescue their own skin. The escape remains an important symbol of courage and moral strength. Everybody can ask, do you have the courage to rescue Jews now if you was in this situation? And that's a message that continues to resonate. Adrian Murray, DW, reporting from Gilalai and Copenhagen. Who we are now is who we would have been then. That is perhaps the true urgency of the idea of never again on a continent in which both anti-Semitism and Islamophobia are on the rise. To France now, where President Emmanuel Macron has vowed to significantly reduce immigration, with the government promising to submit new restrictions on illegal immigration to Parliament. The announcements come as the number of migrants landing in neighbouring Italy has risen to between six to 8,000 people a week. Most migrants entering Italy head north, with many crossing into France, despite the recent deployment of a new French border force. John Lawrenson took the train to Monton on the French side of the Franco-Italian border to find out more. A police van door slams shut, several what look like African migrants inside. We're at Monton Garavant station near the border with Italy. I've just got off the train from Paris and walked into this. Have they just come over the border? I ask a police officer. Yes, he replies. 44 so far this morning. They'll now drive them back to the border. There's frustration in Britain that France won't take back migrants who cross from Calais. But on some days, the French now push back 300 migrants to Italy. Monton, previously known for its lemons, now as a stop on the immigration trail from Africa to Northern Europe. I walk the half a kilometre up to what has become once again a pretty serious frontier with 500 extra police this year and a seemingly endless derogation from the Schengen Agreement on free movement inside the EU. I stop to look at a new French border facility where migrants arrested after 5pm are held till the following day. In metal prefabs, containers the NGOs call them, there are no beds inside apparently. Some of the migrants are being released. As each migrant emerges, a policeman says, Allez, off you go, pointing them in the direction of Italy. I walk that way myself to where some 15 or so migrants from Syria, Tunisia, Algeria, but mainly sub-Saharan Africa, are waiting for a bus to take them back to Vantimiglia, the first town inside Italy, from where most will try again. There are two women... One doesn't want to talk into a microphone and the other is too ill to talk. Every so often she gets up and vomits over the low wall in the shade of which we're sheltering from the sun. A couple of men agree to tell their stories. Camarade is 22, he says, from Guinea. He left eight years ago when he was 14. He's lived in Italy for two years and France for six In Europe, he's received enough help to survive, food, medical treatment, housing, but not the training he hoped for. He's never had a job. This year, he lost his flat and is now sleeping rough. He started selling drugs and drinking. He went to Italy to see a friend who was ill. The French won't let him back into France. Now, he says, if either Italy or France will pay his ticket, he'll go back to Guinea and become a farmer. Nabil, 23, is also from Guinea. He says he got some schooling but stopped after his parents died. He scraped by selling phone recharge cards before making his way to Tunisia, where he worked as a builder and encountered a lot of racism. He made the sea crossing, picked up by the Italian Coast Guard. He's been sleeping rough in Vantimiglia for a week. This is his second attempt to get into France, where he hopes to get a job fitting aluminium window frames and settle down. He spent last night in one of the metal prefabs. There were so many people, he didn't sleep at all. (laughs) 
Back at Montangarvan, the police have arrested more migrants trying to get into France by train. It's the easiest way, but the least likely to succeed. Others go by foot, some on mountain paths over the Alps. Others stow away in cars and lorries. These ones I overhear are from Eritrea and Sudan, and two of them say they are 12 years old. What are you going to do with them? I ask the police. If they're under 18, they stay here, they reply unaccompanied minors that the local authorities are legally bound to look after. Almost 4,000 have arrived here so far in this particular border region, up from fewer than 2,000 last year. Existing capacity is 1,000. The prefect has started requisitioning buildings outside the town centres, hotels, a gym. I take a bus to what was a children's holiday camp in the mountains above Monton. Excuse me, is there someone? I ring the bell at the gate. No one answers. A couple of lads leaning out of their windows say they're coming down to talk to me, but a person from the charity running this place stops them for their protection, he explains, and I must go away. Up in the pretty village of Saint Agnès, I meet a few people who say the migrants, who are free to come and go, at least when I'm not about, often come up here, play a bit of football. They don't cause any trouble, they say. But that doesn't mean they necessarily agree they should be here. At a cafe, a man called Paul says we don't want them. He doesn't want to be interviewed. But later on, as I'm hitchhiking back to Monton, he stops and gives me a lift and is more forthcoming about why he doesn't think these migrants should be allowed in. It's the worst thing to do. Why is that? Because they're not adapted to our civilization. Most of them, when they are settled, they don't want it. And that's 99% of them, because you can see what they do when they are there. They're only here for the social side of things, where they can benefit of all sorts of things, better than we do, most of the time. Do you think most people think like you? I ask him. Of course, he says, we express it in the way we vote. And now it's going to be even more. John Lawrence and DW, Monton, France. French elections are due to take place in June next year. For a more hopeful look at European responses to migration, stay tuned. We're off to Spain next. That's here on Inside Europe with me, Kate Laycock. As governments across Europe talk tough on immigration, Spain is trying a different approach. The Spanish Ministry of Inclusion, Social Security and Migration has joined forces with the National Olympic Committee to launch an innovative project designed to help integrate refugees with their local communities through sports centres and sporting activities. Eight Olympic ambassadors have been elected and duly presented at the project's launch. Our Madrid correspondent, Ashish Sharma, was there to see it happen. As an emotive video showing the exploits of the eight Olympic ambassadors is played out on a giant screen, they're sat on a main stage flanked on either side by the brains behind this proposal including the president of the Spanish Olympic Committee, as well as the two ministers involved in this project. José Luis Escriva, the Minister of Inclusion, Social Security and Migration, reveals that 25 centres around Spain and the Canary Islands will offer refugees an escape from the traumas they've experienced through exercise and sporting activities. Some of these centres are in buildings or on land which are no longer used. 14 centres are being established in this way, and we estimate that this will enable some 6,000 people to use these spaces. 
We want to work with local councils so that the refugees are integrated with the local community. That's the essence of this project. The role of the ambassadors hasn't been fully defined yet, but will be a mixture of overseeing sporting activities and may even involve some coaching. Amongst the eight ambassadors are also several who themselves came as refugees to Spain, such as Marta Mangue, who won a bronze medal in handball in the London 2012 Olympics. Now is the new project, uh, the first country who is making this uh, project. And now we try to give a better life to the refugees, to give the opportunity to make a sport and try to forget the problems and how they came to this country. and. Uh, it's interesting because you are based in the Canary Islands, which is often the first place where a lot of the, uh, the boats arrive. What kind of experiences have you had of seeing that in person? It's touched my heart, you know, because uh, Canary Island is my island and also my father came to Canary Island to have a better life, to study. And when I see every day to come uh, 300 people with family, uh, pregnant, uh, sometimes it's impossible because uh, it's so many people, we don't have this space to keep everybody there. But now this project uh, will be more specific to give them uh, the space and support of course. And why was it important for you to become involved in this project? For me it's helping, helping is the most uh, important for me try to listen to the people, how they came, how we can help, how we can be close to them. We want a medal and they can be also a winner. Juan Lino, who won bronze in the long jump in the 2004 Olympics in Athens, is another whose family came as refugees from Cuba. Juan has already been working with refugees at a sports centre in Getafe, just outside Madrid. It's one of 11 new installations for the project. The problems that we have here in Spain or elsewhere in Europe are far, far removed from the problems these people have. They tell me that the hour and a half that they spend in the gym is an hour and a half of tranquility and liberation. It also allows them to interact with each other. In a refugee center, there are many, many nationalities. But in a gymnasium, everyone does the same activity so they have more connection there than in a refugee centre. For Miquel Liceta, Spain's Minister for Culture and Sport, the reason to get behind this project as well as fund it is quite simple. We are answering a call made by the President of the International Olympic Committee, Thomas Bach. He launched a foundation of uh, Olympic refugees and the, the team of refugees in the Olympic Games and he asked for uh, Olympic national committees to do some kind of uh, activities or taking initiatives on that. And the Spanish Olympic Committee has decided to answer this call with a strong uh, amount of resources that we have pouring into that. The success would be making people in Spain more aware of the problems of refugees and more sol solidar on, on that. Because uh, we feel that sports mm, includes values, but these values shall take ground, shall make it, uh, them concrete. And this is a concrete way of solidarity that makes a better society and a better sport. Spain feels this is a win-win situation. The country is on the front line as refugees arrive daily on its shores by boat. The hope is that once these 25 centres are fully functioning, it will help integrate refugees with their local communities. But also, as in the case of Juan and Marta, potentially could also provide Olympic champions for the future. Ashish Sharma, DW, Madrid. And that is the note on which we are going to end this week's show. This programme was produced by Helen Sini with help from me, Kate Laycock, and sound engineer Ziad Abu Sleiman. Inside Europe comes to you from DW in Bonn, Germany.